am very delighted to welcome to the first time facilitator podcast, David Knorr, or Knorr for short. Hey, welcome to the show. Leanne, it's great to be with you. I have been so excited. I, I, I met you on a, another call, was it a few weeks ago? And as soon as I hopped off, I thought I need to chat to this guy more because he's just created this amazing phrase. And we'll talk a bit more about that phrase in a moment. But first of all, can you please provide a bit of context for our listeners on the work that you do uh, and what drove you to, to sort of find this path of speaking, facilitating training? Uh, and, and you're an author too. Sure. So uh, easiest way to describe what I do is I help uh, global companies, global leaders find net new growth opportunities, right? Typically through uh, innovation. Uh, and, and my unique lens on that is their strategic relationships. So uh, I advise global companies. I'm an adjunct faculty at a couple of universities. I do executive education. I do executive coaching. The common thread is this idea that your relationships are, number one, your biggest asset. Number two, uh, if applied to those challenges, to those outcomes, they can actually accelerate your ability to get there. So uh, one of my first books, almost crazy to believe, 20 years ago Mm -hmm. was called Relationship Economics. And in it, uh, I proved this concept that uh, relationships are more than just a soft skill. It's more than just networking. It uh, should be intentional, should be strategic, and ideally, if it's quantifiable, uh, in your journey from now to next. And the way I got into this is, uh, as you may remember the story, I'm originally from Iran, uh, immigrated to the U.S. in 1981, Leanne, with a hundred bucks, a suitcase, didn't know anybody, didn't speak a word of English. Uh, I came to the States to finish high school and went to college and uh, early part of my career was technology. So IBM and Silicon graphics and business objects. Then I went to consulting and private equity world. Uh, I was president of a company. And then for the last 18 years, I've been on my own doing this, this uh, kind of strategic advisory work. I feel like I'm talking to the face of the American dream. I'm the poster child, right? (laughs) This is, this is, this is what it's about is, is, uh, and now I'm grateful to my parents in their 80s because they saw a better future for me uh, coming here and finishing school here and building a life here. And an, and an uncle that took me in that I hadn't seen since birth. Uh, and yeah, they gave me a chance to get an education and earn a living and married now 24 years and two teenage kids and two crazy wow. dogs. <laughs> I'm so glad you included the dogs. I've got two dogs as well. They're crazy around feeding time. They're, they're sleeping right now. So. There you go. Uh, so you've, just from the sounds of it and uh, from, I don't know if I can hear it in your voice or see it in your body language. It's probably a bit of both, but there is some sort of self-belief that you've got. You've had this track record of success. Mm. what can you sort of boil that down to? Is it the relationships? Is it the fact that you just go for things and you show up? What do you think has been sort of the winning mix for you in terms in building your career? Yeah, I, I, I honestly believe a lot of it is what I call the immigrant success DNA. Uh, I found some really interesting data that uh, immigrants are four times more likely to become millionaires than those, uh, particularly in the US, than those who are born here. And if you think about it, uh, ever since I was a child, it was driven into me that, you know, the world doesn't owe you anything. Uh, education is something that nobody can ever take away from you. Uh, combine intellect, right? You can't train intelligence. So combine intellect with scrappiness and with hustle. And um, I've always been driven as long as I can remember. Uh, I've always... Um, uh, I, I got to tell you a quick story. Uh, uh, so I wanted to get out and speak, right? And uh, I'm, I'm dating myself because this is, this is going back 15, 18 <laughs> years ago. And everybody said, you need a demo reel. In that, at that time, you need a demo tape. And I'm like, well, how do you do that? How do you, it's a chicken and egg, right? I want to speak more, but you need a demo tape to get more <laughs> speaking engagements. So you're going to really chuckle and your audience is going to enjoy this. Uh, I got a friend uh, with a camcorder we went to five, six area hotels near where I lived where they already had stages set up for other events. And I jumped on stage and I would just start talking about my concepts. They edited in my slides and some audiences clapping and that was my first demo video. 
And that's what I used to get a speaking engagement for, I kid you not, $75. The next one became 250 bucks and the next one became, yeah, and that's how you grow. And, and, and that led to 104 speeches in one year, several years later. But that's an example of not letting obstacles like you don't have a demo reel get in the way of what you're after. Find a way, get creative, get scrappy, find a way to get there. That's so freaking cool. Congratulations. I, I really admire that. Um, reminds me because I have the chicken and egg thing when I was trying to get a job in marketing. They're like, you need marketing experience, but how do you get experience if you can't get a job? So for my job application, I just did this video about the company. I went out and interviewed like their customers and just put it all together, learned how to hack my way through iMovie. Out of 200 people scored the job because it's just about, yeah, finding that extra effort and just being a little bit creative. So that's you bringing in your innovation. Now the phrase you talk about, oh, sorry, did you want to sort of add to that? No, no, I was just going to say that, that it's, I'm amazed of how many people use their situations as, as crutches. Well, I can't or, and, and, and it frustrates, I love my kids and it frustrates the daylights out of me when I hear from them, you know, I can't do that or I don't have this or, you know, find a way, right? So if, if the will is there, if the willingness is there, the ability, the capability, the, 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 the enablers of you getting there, you get creative, you get scrappy, you find a way to get there. Mm -hmm. But don't let things get in your way because you don't have capital or you don't have the right skills or you don't have the right resources, whatever. Fine. And, and, and by the way, this is also a, a time of our recording. It's a really interesting time to leverage this, really see this pandemic, this global pandemic as an impetus to rethink, reimagine, uh, reinvent, reinvigorate parts of your life, parts of your job, parts of your business, parts of your revenue model. This is the time to really th see this as a springboard and go after that next level of your personal and professional growth. Absolutely. It's funny that you say that when you hear people saying, I can't, it's, it can frustrate you. It definitely frustrates me, but I also feel like then I try and like motivate them and go, yes, you can, or reframe it. And that sometimes can have a negative response for that person. They get even more defensive and sort of dig in their heels. Do you find yeah, that? I, I do. And I have found that, that, that motivation is, is in, it, it has to come from within, yeah. right? It, it has to be you and I, I just don't believe we can, motivate maybe momentarily but that's a sprint right and mm -hmm. and to succeed at anything you got to think of it as a, as a marathon right so I, I ran into and of course you run into friends who uh, they're like it's amazing what an overnight success you've become in the corner of my office i have a close tree with name badges of every keynote i've delivered over the last 18 years and if you just do the math of on a low, you know, a, a slow year, 20 engagements, and you heard a high, you know, a crazy year, 104 engagements. Over 18 years, you, can, you cannot see the metal poles, right? And that's what it takes to perfect something. That's what it takes to really get good at something is that will that, you know what, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to figure out that next step. And I'm still not done yet. Right. So, so pandemic aside, the fact that we, I may not be getting on a stage anytime soon, you, you still, there are other things I want to do. And, and that's what you have to have is that drive that says, I, I, I know my now, I can see my next. How do I bridge my now to next? Mm. Do you ever sort of, how do you manage that? Because I'm, I'm, I, I sound very similar to you, but I like every day it's like I could do this or this. Like I, I have no shortage of ideas, but how do you pick the next, what is next for you? Ah, there's the discipline. So I've always believed no margin, no mission. If you don't have a sound business model, if you don't have a sound and a profitable business, you're never going to be able to grow personally, professionally, or the business. So beyond all your phenomenal ideas, you have to start with your target audience, right? Mm -hmm. So what is that target audience? What does my market need? And, not, and, and my mother-in-law or your mother-in-law are not our buyers, right? Our cousins are not our buyers, right? Mm -hmm. Stop talking to people that have no impact on 
your actual business and go talk to buyers. And, and, and if you just ask questions about, forget your own products and services for a second, how are they doing certain things? And you have to form your own supposition. So hold on a second, how do you do that? And then what happens? And then who do you go to for that? And where do you get that from? And you ask enough, and I, and I, co and I include this in my coaching. I tell people, go on a listening tour. Because if you go ask people you like, you respect, you trust, right? Um, you know, kind of about a scenario. Or the other way is ask, what do you believe? Those who know you, what do you believe I do exceptionally well? And that's what I did is when I left a corporate job, yeah, I want to go consult. But what is it that I, you know, there's a lot I can do. What, what, are, what are the people that I, what are my relationships? What are people, I, again, I respect, I trust believe what's the perceptions of my strengths and they consistently said you network better than anybody else we've ever met if you can teach other people how to do that you'll succeed so that's where relationship economics and that's where a lot of the subsequent work came from was focusing that's a long answer to your short question <laughs> focusing on a few really core capabilities and competencies that allow you to build the foundation of a business and really gaining some depth in that area before you branch out to other things. Mm. I'm getting a sort of full circle moment. I actually ran a listening tour a couple of months ago with my listeners and it was amazing just hopping on 20 minute Zoom calls with people all around the world. I loved it. No expectation, just asking questions and listening. Were you the one that started that? Because I got the idea from Jenny Blake and she said that she knew some executive that actually did a listening tour. Maybe it was you, full circle. Yeah, and I and I've I've uh, I've done that several times. Again, I, I'm I'm practicing what I preach. I'm kind of eating some of my own cooking, uh, you know. And now, really thinking of of my own personal S curve, and uh, I'm using this this pandemic as a as an impetus to really think about key parts of my business differently. And there's two or three paths that I want to pursue. And, and again, this is what I teach organizations, right? So if you have a portfolio approach to ideas, you develop them in parallel, you invest a little bit of money, you want to reduce risk, invest a little bit of money across these three ideas or five ideas and develop the quality gates, right? So I'm going to go talk to 20 people. If you know 10 of them have this problem with this one, and only three have a problem with that. I'm going to kill the three, right? Kill that mm -hmm. one. And then really focus on the one that seems to be viable. It seems to be, you know, has more traction and it's, and it's, and it's easier to understand. And so you, if you take your ideas to these quality gates, A, you build an environment of experimentation. And if you do that, you're going to iterate, which is you're going to do the same thing better you do enough iteration, it's going to lead to opportunities to innovate, which is doing new things. You do enough new things, you're going to find an opportunity to disrupt. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that stair step. So disruption and innovation is really cool and sexy to talk about in our world. It is really hard work. It's expensive. It is uh, emotionally draining because you know, you're babies, right? You get really excited about all these different things you yeah. want to do. And some of them, and by the way, a mentor drove into me, you better be willing to kill 999 flowers so you can grow that one oak tree. So Whoa. if you get emotionally attached to all mm. these ideas, it's going to be very difficult for you to say, that's just not a viable idea. That's not going to go anywhere. I'm not going to keep throwing good money at bad. Mm -hmm. And you pull the plug. If you don't do that, you get spread way too thin, you get scattered, and you're not going to do any of it well. Yeah, thank you. For, I feel like that advice is coming directly at me because uh, I think that's the thing. There's so many ideas every single day and you keep adding to that portfolio, then it's very easy to get into that overwhelm and you're sort of just not, not, even, not even giving your full efforts on a particular thing. So you're not really actually investing in it and letting it grow because it's so scat. It's like a real scattergun approach. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. And, and somebody else asked me this yesterday. There's nothing mm. wrong with that. What I call the idea funnel, right? Mm. Having a bunch of ideas come in. You just better have a filtering mechanism of which are ones are the most viable, which ones are the most relevant. Where can I get the highest return on my invested time, effort, and resources amongst these competing ideas? Mm. And I'm a big believer of, again, a portfolio approach. So 
Right now, I'm pursuing three distinct paths to evolve my business. I'm an equally investing in each of these three. I'm having 20, 30 conversations a week on each of them, right? And I'm getting a lot of data on what resonates, what doesn't, and I'm constantly tweaking, right? And, and you, again, you have this quality gate. I have this next phase I want to get all three of them to good chance I'm going to kill one so I can focus on the other two. Mm -hmm. And at the next gate, good chance I'm going to kill one of those. And you know what? I'm going to move forward with the one that I don't believe I have proven with data, with testing, that it's the most viable in the evolution of my mm -hmm. business. Now let's talk about an idea that has made it through the filter. And that is your mm -hmm. book. The title, so curve benders. I love that phrase. Uh, and I think I put in my email to you. I, I would call it strategic relationships. When I reflect back, I've been a solopreneur for just over a year now. And if I look at all the gigs that I've scored, it's been down to maybe three people that have landed me these opportunities. Uh, can you please explain to our audience what a curve bender is? And then I think, you know, we might hear the de definition and think, well, how do I find more curve benders in my life? How do I connect more closely with them? Yeah. So as you were kind enough to mention in the beginning, I, I've, I've spent the last 20 years being a student of business relationships, right? And 10 books later, um, the first one was relationship economics that talked a lot about be more intentional, strategic, and quantifiable about your relationships. The, the most recent one, Co-Create, is really focused on capitalizing on your most, most valuable relationships to innovate, to really co-create and come up with products, services, business models, direction, path that you wouldn't be able to identify or create or nurture on your own. So Curve Benders is really my Star Wars trilogy, right? Relationship economics, co-create Curve Benders. And the premise is certain relationships come into our lives that dramatically bend, shape our growth journey. So let me explain. Uh, I'm 52. I believe uh, I have a good 20 years, hopefully, left to continue to work. So I, I got several years ago, I got really curious, and that's how books start for me. I, they typically mm -hmm. start with a question. I got really curious about what will the next 20 years, two decades of work look like, right? And I have six grad students that uh, embarked on this social science research for me. And we've identified 15 forces that are going to dramatically change the way we work, the way we live, the way we play, and the way we give. And just as a data point, this whole COVID-19 is an example of what's called a black swan event, mm -hmm. which is unpredictable, massive impact, uh, economic and, and social, financial, uh, and uh, societal. And uh, we can justify and we can explain them with hindsight afterwards, right? So for us to remain relevant, we're all on this, we should be, we ideally are on this growth trajectory. Now, I'm going to take you and your audience back to high school algebra because a linear growth, right, it's just a, it's just a 45 degree slope. And it just looks like a, a straight line from bottom left of your screen to the top right. And most people, uh, you know, if they're lucky, they're on that linear growth. As I mentioned, curve benders are strategic relationships. They're more than just great bosses or coaches or mentors. They come into our lives and they profoundly change that linear curve to nonlinear. Or it looks now more like a hockey stick. Mm. And if you've heard of a, a company value, that learning dramatically increases our personal value. It increases our personal value to our employers. It increases our personal value to investors or uh, you know startups or other industries and it, it it dramatically accelerates not just us accomplishing a great deal but leanne it profoundly changes who we become and and when we look back and i've done over 100 interviews the executives i've spoken with can definitively point to two three people in their lives who have dramatically changed that trajectory of their life. Mm -hmm. So it's more than just a, a great customer. It's more than just a great boss or a mentor. Those are all incredibly valuable. And those people do shape our journey. Curve benders, as described, dramatically do it very differently. I, yeah, okay. That's a, it's a really good um, 
sort of overview of what a curve vendor is. As you were talking it through, I was then reflecting on, okay, were those three people in the last year curve vendors? One that definitely stands out for me is uh, Jenny Blake, the author of Pivot. I mentioned her previously on the show. I read that book. It changed my life, connected with her, got to do some work with her. and just love the content uh, just, and what the opportunities that have opened up as a result of that one relationship. It's mm -hmm. been like a truly global fun thing to have. So any tips for our listeners on that they're thinking, okay, I'm looking back, I've got one or two, but I'd love to explore more about I mean, how can you be intentional around this? Is it something intentional or is it you just go to networking events and find someone? What's your secret, Nor? Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm often surprised of how serendipitous some of our relationships are, right? I've, made, I've met some amazing people on airplane. You know, they just happen to sit next to me on an airplane or, or stood next to me in a line somewhere. So I don't discount the serendipitous nature of it. I, I just believe in being more intentional about it. So... Let me give you your audience uh, three tips. Number one, um, you have to get uh, as crystal clear as possible on this journey of your now to next, right? So where are you today? And, and, and pick a time frame, right? In the next three years, in the next five years. Here's where I want to be. Not, 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 again, what I want to accomplish, but um, you know, who have I become? Where am I prioritizing my time, effort, resources? What am I known for, right? My brand. What are my capabilities? What are my skills? What are my knowledge? What are the behaviors I want to change, right? So if you identify your current state and that future state, now you have that journey from now to next, right? In that journey, ideally, then you get really candid, again, with yourself in identifying your capability gaps. So where I want to go my perception is I don't have those skills. Mm -hmm. I've never managed a thousand people. I've never ran a, you know, a, a $10 million or a hundred million dollar business, right? So those are my capability gaps. Great. Once I know that, then I'm proactively looking for who's done those things. Mm -hmm. Who's been to those places? Who's right. And, and, and I'm genuinely authentically, out to develop a, a mutually beneficial relationship with them. Now, mm -hmm. one of the questions that comes up is, you know, why would they care about you, right? What, what, yeah, what would right. they want from <laughs> you, right? right? And, and you'd be surprised. Uh, I think uh, mentors often learn as much about themselves from their mentees. And particularly as you get older, you, your mindset shifts from one of success to one of significance. So you've already been successful. You've already made the money. You already have the vacation home. You've already done a lot of those things that you set out to do. You're really now very focused on, will anybody care that I was here? Did I really make a difference in anybody's life? And they often find that opportunity in a genuinely vested interest in success of others. Mm -hmm. And, and they, uh, you know, Marshall Goldsmith is a good example, right? Number one executive coach in the world. Marshall's in his seventies. A couple of years ago, he decided, you know what? And he's a Buddhist. He said, I'm going to pick a hundred people. I'm going to teach you everything I know about executive coaching for free. All I ask is that you do the same thing for somebody else. Mm -hmm. Leanne, he got 18,000 applications. And, and that's a testament to, and he picked a hundred and it's a testament to the fact that this guy now gets enormous amount of just joy mm -hmm. from teaching and coaching and mentoring and helping others reach incredible new heights. Mm. Couldn't agree more. At my last job, I sort of co-created a reverse mentoring program where we paired our executive leaders up with our graduates. And they just, our exec just got so much joy out of it. It was a three month pilot. And they're like, when can we keep this going? Because I think also when it comes to pairing up with someone that's a bit younger than you, they know all about the tech and the trends and can give you some you know, information on what millennials, what motivates them. So there's all, it's actually just thinking a bit more, I guess we always, I always say you can't see the label when you're inside the bottle. We can't see our own value but it's thinking, okay, what's this person missing? And I think legacy is absolutely, it's a massive driver. So thanks for sharing that. And often asking, what can I do to help you? How can I be an asset to you, right? And, and, and uh, going out of your way to support them. I've always said, uh, 
if you want to build an authentic long-term relationship with somebody, focus on wealth, health, and loved ones. So how can I create wealth with this person? How can I nurture their health? How can I do something for their loved ones, right? So mm -hmm. if somebody does something for our kids, or, or, or you, you and I have dogs, somebody does something nice for our dogs. We're like, oh, that's so sweet of you. That's so nice of you. What can I do to help you? I can, right? So for our kids, uh, people that, that you know, take care of our loved ones, we, we, we feel this enormous gratitude towards Mm. And so is that what you, is that the approach that you take for then maintaining a relationship with someone? Cause I know sometimes if you have like a, maybe a formal mentoring thing or, you know, you catch up for a coffee and then it's like, great. Okay. Then how do you maintain that? Yeah. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm often reminded and I, and I, and I want to remind your, your audience that sociologists tell us that an average individual can proactively manage about a hundred to 150 relationships. Oh, okay. That's got to do with our tribal setup. Yeah. So yeah. the key is million dollar question is how do you know and, and which ones and how do you, if you can't invest in everybody equally, how do you then prioritize which relationships you invest in? So I'm, I'm often making relationship lists and I coach people to do this, right? Sit down and make a list of, I call it your ABC list, right? 10, 20, 30, 50 people that are most relevant most relevant to kind of your, your personal and professional growth, right? And again, this is, I'm not trying to teach you or your audience how to, how to manipulate or how to use people. That's not, a, no. that's not what this is. This is simply about prioritizing where and how you invest, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, let's just say 30, right? So that 30, I'm contacting on a regular basis. I'm constantly trying to add value. I send them something. I introduce them to someone. I'm making sure I nurture that on a regular basis. The others, uh, I create a different cadence for, right? So this next group, I'm going to make sure I touch base with at least once a quarter. This next group, I want to make sure I touch base at least once every six months, right? Mm -hmm. So if you create tiers, right, based on, again, depth and value, uh, value in terms of relevance, right, is what I'm talking about. Yeah. And, and everybody else, you know, they get my newsletter. They, they can follow me on social and I can add value there. But in terms of authentic, real relationships, don't overwhelm yourself trying to be everything to everybody because you can't, you, you simply cannot, none of us can keep up with everybody. But if you prioritize your most strategic, your most relevant, your most valuable relationships, and you nurture those, and then after you've touched those, kind of make sure you've got a regular cadence for touching and following up and adding value to others, those who want to be in a relationship with you will reciprocate. And that's really what a relationship takes is this give and take. So I don't want to feel guilty about the fact that I haven't called you for six, nine, 12 months. Last time I checked, the telephone works both ways. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, it's been several presidents since I've dated, but if you try to date somebody who doesn't want to date you, it's an uphill battle. It just doesn't work, right? <laughs> Business relationships are the same way. If yeah, they get value good. from your interactions, most people will reciprocate. Most people will reach out. And, and, and the true ones, right? Mm -hmm. What I've learned is relationships may grow cobwebs. They may grow some rust on them. But if they're, if they're true and if they're value-based, it's okay. Use me as an excuse. Listen, I heard on a podcast this guy talk about business relationships, and it dawned on me I've done a terrible job staying in touch with you. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to call and say hello and touch base and hear how you're doing and how you're doing with this awful pandemic. And I hope you and your loved ones are healthy and safe. And by the way, last time we spoke, you were running this business. How's that going? And what are you up to now? So those are all great ways to reconnect, reinitiate uh, touches. If there are value, if there weren't, don't, don't waste your time or theirs. Mm. Uh, it just wasn't meant to be and move on. Thank you for talking about the guilt for not contacting people. And you've also just given us, I feel like getting onto rev.com and just getting that all transcribed because I was actually thinking there was a client I worked with at the beginning of the year. And I, it's been hard because I don't know if she's been made redundant. I feel a bit awkward about reaching out. I don't want her to feel like I'm reaching out be because I, I want something. I, I want it to be in like, Hey, I just, just checking in. And, and I think you've given us a great framework for doing that. Let me, if I could add to that, this is, yes, um, you brought up a great point. 
uh, if uh, there's, th I've always believed there's three types of relationship builders, right? Givers, people that altruistically just give, they get something where, you, you know, you fork from just giving. Mm -hmm. Takers, who the only time they call is when they want something, right? Yeah. And, and they, by the way, they never see themselves as takers. And then relationship investors. And, and I want to, my comment here is, is particularly during this global pandemic, this is not the time to sell. This is the time to nurture. This is the time to add value. This is the time to problem solve. This is the time to ask, what can I do to help? Even if it has nothing to do with your products or services. Mm -hmm. I got a call from a client the other day and they, they were looking for something and it isn't what I do. And I said, wait a minute, let me think about it. Let me comb my network. I'll call you back. I called them back within the hour and I said, here are three other people, three people that do that. Would you like an introduction? And he said, absolutely. I made the introductions. The people that I introduced were, were elated. He was elated. And, and he said, I feel bad because you, you, you know, I'm paraphrasing. You're not getting anything from this. I said, listen, your relationship is more important to me than any transaction, right? I'm mm. here. If I can help you, let me know. But these three people I know will take care of you and take care of what you need. Mm. That, that equity, that relationship equity you just build with that person is far more valuable than any invoice you can send them. Mm. So stop selling start nurturing. This is the time to nurture those relationships, solve problems, add value. Again, use this podcast as an excuse, right? About I will. I will definitely. <laughs> I, 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 use, I use, you know, I tell people if you're new in a company, use that you're new for like the next five years, right? I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm new here, right? Use this podcast. I heard this podcast and he said I should reach out to relationships. I yeah, but I thought you listened to that podcast like six months ago. Yeah, but this podcast talked a lot about relationships and I'm reaching out to ask how you doing and what's going on. And yeah, it's a fantastic impetus to, to do just that. Just how you doing? What are you doing? What are you seeing? What are you hearing? What crossroad do you find yourself at? What are you struggling with? What can I do to help? If I wanted to help, how could I help you? Right? And, and, and again, if you just go on that listening tour, right? It's amazing what people will tell you. Yeah. Awesome. Gosh, you got me so activated to take action. I know you said, oh, I don't believe in giving people motivation, but you've certainly injected a bit of uh, re-engagement blood into, into what I'm going to do today. So thank you so much for that. And I hope that listeners, if you're paying attention, hopefully you're not driving, but yeah, just do a quick reach out to someone that you've been thinking about connecting with um, and let us know. Let, us, let Nora and I know how you go with that. Just to change tack a bit, I know you talked about how you're, um, what you're working on during this pandemic. And one thing that I've heard that you are doing is signing up for like every webinar under the sun. You are not watching Netflix. You are not binging on Stan. You are binging on webinars. So can you please tell me from a, a participant perspective, what kind of cool things you're seeing or on, on the alternative, what things you think, gosh, why are people sort of repeating that same strategy? It's so boring. What are you noticing in your webinar tour? Sure. So uh, just to give your audience some context, I've uh, signed up for, attended, or I've watched replays of 128 webinars in a two-week period. <laughs> and, right, and it's, it's insane, right? Uh, number one, um, lo unfortunately, a lot of them were, in all candor, a complete waste of time, right? And by that, I mean, uh, uh, we're still trying to figure out how to engage and influence others virtually. So I, I, I started doing webinars about 10 years ago. Uh, they were cool. They were interesting. It was, not, it was a novelty early on. And then they kind of caught on and everybody did them. And last few years, they've actually become passe, right? Uh, at, at, it's crazy. I even early on charged for them, charged for webinars, clients for putting them on and attendees for, for listening to them because it was a, a new medium for delivering content. And again, they've, they've spiked again more recently because we can't physically see each other and there's no events and those kinds of things. But I'm reminded when television first came out, uh, Leanne, interesting story. They used to uh, televise radio shows. So they would literally put a camera on people that were doing radio shows and that's what they would show on TV because that's what they knew. When the internet first came out, most websites were nothing but a brochure. I mean, it's almost like they took the brochure and they put it online. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, what I'm learning is you cannot take the same, and I'm saying this respectfully, boring yeah. content that you were delivering in person 
and just put it on Zoom or put it on GoToWebinar or put it on Microsoft Teams and expect the other side to get all excited about it. Because what you don't have, particularly facilitators, particularly those that deliver their value in person, I can't walk over to your desk and look at your workbook or I can't you know, pat you on the back and say, nice job. Or I can't get you to come up to the whiteboard and, you know, draw or capture something and engage and interact with you in that tactile fashion. So the ones that are fabulous uh, are slowly uh, embracing, adapting, adopting uh, new, uh, highly interactive, highly engaging, highly immersive uh, learning experiences. And it's no longer about me being the talking head with, I've got 178 slides. I need you to sit there, be quiet. I've got 30 minutes. I'm going to go through them. It's more about conversation and collaboration and co-creation. And I don't have all the answers, but let me, let me create an environment for inquiry. And let me let the, the group all with very different perspective and lenses shed the light on their, their ideas, their, mm. their lens, their perspective, where they're coming from, right? So uh, the older I get, the more of these webinars and things I sit on, the more I appreciate uh, an environment of inquiry. Let's ask mm. some better questions. Let's ask some great questions. The more I appreciate intelligent experimentation, right? So I asked this question, and as I said, I'm on, you know, here's an idea that I'm thinking of pursuing. Let me go talk to a bunch of people and I'm going to package it and prototype something and, and test that. And that's an intelligent experimentation. Mm. And then really exploring co-creation. So I don't have all the answers. I think I'm really good at this. Who else can I collaborate with? Who else can I work with to create something or co-create something but as I said, neither one of us could have done alone. And by the way, it's dramatically better. It's dramatically stronger as a product or a service or a value add because two or more parties came together. Yeah, I do find that really interesting, uh, particularly when I was a first-time facilitator. I uh, and take back in the real world, <clears throat> I thought that I had to be that sort of expert up the front of the room and that was the value that I was bringing. And I think that's the same philosophy that we're seeing on these webinars that kind of tank. It's like, well, I'm the professional, this is my point of view and, and it's just listening. So it's really about, I guess, being a little bit, not, I don't know if it's vulnerable, but being open to, uh, like you said, co-creating and actually recognizing that the collective group can actually build something that is, um, plus they get more invested in it as well by being a contributor. And, and you asked about best practices. One of the things I've started doing in an hour webinar, I, I bring about 30 minutes of content. Yeah. I'm, I make sure it's value packed. And that's the other thing. Um, most webinars, if you don't engage me in the first five, 10, 15 minutes, if you don't bring it, if you don't bring energy, if you don't bring excitement, if uh, I want to thank you for being here today, because what I want to talk to you, just, <laughs> just shoot me, right? Just shoot me. I have no interest in it. You lost me at hello, right? So if you don't bring energy, if you don't bring excitement, if you're not excited about what you're presenting for the love of sweet baby Jesus, go find something else to present, please, because I'm going to get zero value from what you're bringing to the table. So conversely, if I, if I join your webinar and you're excited, and it doesn't have to be a, a show or a, or a front, but you got to be excited about your topic. And listen, uh, I'm going to go hard. I'm going to go 30 minutes. I'm going to ask a bunch of questions. Then we're going to break out in smaller groups. And I want you to think about these three questions and come back and share what you guys talked about. And I'm trying to tell you and your audience, most people will get more out of that session than I'm going to sit here and work on my grocery list while you go through all your slides. Because I am not tuned in. I'm not engaged. I, I can't. We're not in the same room. We're physically not in the same space. I need to be more engaged to really learn in a, in a highly interactive, engaging, if not an immersive experience. So... I, I, you're going to chuckle at this. Your, your audience is going to love this. Uh, going back to Scrappy, right? I hired my 16-year-old son, and over a weekend, we researched 75 different uh, communication, collaboration, uh, remote work uh, tools and websites. And I'm taking one a week, 
and I try to learn a new video about it every day. And I, I create sandboxes. Most of them have free trials. So I create sandboxes and I test a lot of things. And we're, we're doing these digital whiteboards. I'm teaching a two-day program at a local university where uh, you're going to love this. No PowerPoints. And it's going to be all this digital whiteboard where they all jump in and they build. And I kid you not, they're going to they're gonna build and they're going to put post-it notes and dot voting and all the things that we do in the live world, they're going to do purely digital. And I think we'll all get a lot more out of it than just me boring the crap out of people with PowerPoints. Mm. <clears throat> I feel like I'm going to call this episode, You Lost Me at Hello. <laughs> it's genius. Maybe the title of your next book. Right. Uh, so um, just to wrap up, I just want to quickly talk to you because even when I got on the call to you, you did just bring it with your energy and just uh, you got the humor. You're a good conversationalist. How did you develop that over time? Or let's maybe more, let's talk about your energy and how you get to that peak state before you get on a call like this or before you deliver workshops or keynote speeches. What do you do to prepare like physically, mentally? Sure. So again, I, I think in terms of threes, so let me give you your audience three tips. Number one, do not uh, schedule things back to back. It's really difficult to disengage from one and, and really prepare for uh, the next one if they're back to back. So if, if you have any control over your schedule, um, you know, give yourself a little more margin, a little more time between these things. Number two, uh, you know, and, and I, on my calendar, even though we're not traveling, I actually add travel time. So it blocks off an additional 15 minutes or half an hour between things. So I can, I can, I can, we need time to think. We don't make enough time to think. Number two, um, uh, I, 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 I like routines. So I'm up really early in the morning. I, I exercise. Uh, I, I try to watch what I eat. Uh, but I'm, you know, usually have breakfast with my family. I'm at my desk early enough in the morning or I come and work and then go have breakfast with them when they get up because kids are wrapping up school and their schedules are off a little bit. Um, and, and, you know, so if you're, and I focus on, uh, work that I love I, and I, and I, and I've always said your alarm uh, is a great litmus test, right? If you hit that snooze button 10, 15, 20 times and you genuinely don't want to get out of bed to go tackle whatever you're doing, it's really time to be honest with yourself and go do something else. You got to go do things that give you energy. It does every part of what I do fabulous and oh, no, right? By the same token, if I generally look at a week, I love what I do. And if you genuinely are excited about what you're doing and the the, the projects you tackle and the clients you work with and people you call colleagues or collaborators, if you're excited about that, um, I, you don't need a whole lot more you know, motivation. Uh, mm -hmm. The last thing I want to tell is, is, is share with you is, and most audiences know this, yet we seldom practice it, which is multitasking is a myth. Be centered, be focused, do one thing at a time, do it exceptionally well, finish it, finish it before you move on to the next one. Because if I'm talking to you and I've got this other thing over here and I'm doing something else over here, your mind cannot, cannot focus on any of them and you're never going to do your best work. So I clear my desk. I focus on one task at a time. I get it done and I move on or I get to a, a, a viable pausing place. And I can set it aside and move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Three awesome tips. I love the way that you think in threes as well. And Nor, I guess I don't hit the snooze button, but I definitely got out of bed very excited to know that I was going to hop on the microphone with you this morning. Absolutely love. Like we talked about a range of different topics about building relationships, about innovation, nurturing them, and um, how to kickstart our webinars and making sure they're interactive and that we co-create along the way. So thank you so much for all of the expertise and funny stories that you shared as part of this. If our listeners would love to connect with you, find out more about the work that you do, where should we send them? Sure. So very kind of you. Thanks for having me. Uh, uh, best place is our website, which is just Nor Group, N O U R Group dot com. Uh, we have uh, I have a blog. I have a podcast. We actually just created a forum. Uh, which there's no cost to it, but you register as a member and I put exclusive content and resources and events there. So if you just go to Nor Group, N-O-U-R group.com, 
There's a ton of stuff there. My social channels are there. Uh, and I'd love to hear from you and your audience about how any of these ideas have been helpful to you. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much. I'll definitely sign up for that forum. It's been a delight. Thank you, Noor. My pleasure. Good to be with you.